coming out this evening to spend some time with us around the Word of God. God willing tonight, I hope to show you from God's Word what he tells us about his plan and what he tells us about his purpose with this earth and with mankind thereon. We need to establish a foundation for our remarks this evening and say from the outset that we believe the Bible to be the only source of infallible information that we have concerning God. And that's an important point because not only do we believe quite fervently that the Bible is the only source of infallible information, but we believe it to be the foundation on which we can build a picture of what God has intended with this earth and with mankind thereon. And it makes logical sense that if we wish to find out about God, we have to turn to the very place that God has communicated those things to us with. We might think that that's an obvious statement, but it's, it's not that obvious when we have a look at the, the world around us. There are many religions in the world. There are many very fervent and sincere people who sincerely believe in God, and yet they turn to other scriptures and literatures for sources of truth. Even in recent times, there are people who have received visions and dreams and class themselves as prophets and declare that their words can be treated as a source of truth. We don't have to look too far into the, the churches in the world around us to see the Bible being put on shelves only to be replaced by the words of priests. It wasn't that many years ago that even if you had access to a Bible, we were unable to read it as it was written in Latin. And we had to rely on the word of a priest as to what God said is truth. And in recent times, we have more Pentecostal religions built on Holy Spirit gifts and feelings and, and dreams that people have, have received. And so all sorts of sources of truth are being used in the world around us in people's pursuit of what God might be or mean to them. And so it's important that we set the foundation, that we believe that the Bible is the only foundation on which we can place our trust. And while we might have conversations about what the Bible means or how we interpret the Bible, it is not up for discussion that the Bible is indeed infallible. And as will happen, if we are earnest in our search of, in our search of truth, that we will read the Bible and we will come across passages in the Bible that seem not to agree, maybe, with our view of the world. And on those occasions, we have to take a step back and we have to remind ourselves that the Bible is that foundation and that on that occasion, maybe our understanding of the Bible is not correct or maybe our understanding of how the world works is not correct. And so it gives us a starting point. The Bible is correct. How does our world view fit? around the Bible. And so it's not surprising then, or it's not a coincidence that we have the Bible on our laps this evening. You know, the authorship and some of the, the words written in this book that we call the Bible have an origin of some 4,000 years. That's a long time for a book to be preserved down through the ages. And if we think about kingdoms, how many kingdoms have survived 4,000 years? And that would be none. How many artefacts have survived 4,000 years? Sculptures, statues. How many castles have survived for 4,000 years? And yet on our laps we have words that were written some 4,000 years ago. And we can only marvel at the work of God who has seen fit to preserve for us the information that he has given unto us about his plan and his purpose, that we might come to a knowledge of him and his son and how he might have us live before him. It's always worth bringing to mind then the majesty of the God with whom we wish to deal. I think it's an important place to start this morning to remind ourselves of the greatness of the God whom we've come to talk about this evening. On the subject of God's greatness, we have the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 11. And he writes, Oh, how inexhaustible are God's resources and God's wisdom and God's knowledge. How impossible is it to search into his decrees or trace his footsteps? Who has ever known the mind of God or shared his counsels? Who has first given God anything so as to receive payment in, re in return for the universe owes its origin to him, was created by him, 
and has its aims and purpose in him. To him be glory throughout all the ages. Amen. And if nothing else, that tells us that the pursuit of an understanding of who God is and what his plans and what his purpose is, is not a pursuit or it's not a waste of time. That it's a very worthwhile thing or a worthwhile endeavour in which we can engage ourselves. And we should be humbled by the fact that we have such a great God who has condescended unto us or condescended it to a level that he has seen fit to include us in his plan and in his purpose. So concerning God's omnipotence, he knows all things and he declares to us in his word that he does know all things, that he knows the end from the beginning. In Isaiah 46 and verse 9, he tells us, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. And that's worth keeping in mind. There is only one God and there is no other being in the universe that comes close to his majesty and his might. God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So despite having a beginning of creation, he created all things knowing the very outcome of that creation. We might seem, we'll say, well, that seems somewhat pointless. It seems a pointless endeavour if God is going to do something knowing the very outcome. But on the contrary, God did not create rocks or statues and then stand back and admire his creation. He created living beings. He created living beings with the purpose that after a period of time, those beings, through their own free will, decide to love God, take a desire in his plan and his purpose, desire to emulate his character and be involved in what God has intended. And that gives great pleasure unto God. He knew that from the very day of creation that that's what his plan and purpose was. The Apostle Peter tells us, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It's telling us about the depth and breadth of God's knowledge, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So it's telling us that God is aware of and interested in all the minute details down through time. If we were to take one day and break it into a thousand little pieces, God knows all the details of his plan and his purpose. And yet at the same time, God is very well aware of the big picture. He can view vast spaces of time, thousands of years, as though it was but a moment. And so God does know all things. He knows the end from the beginning and all the small details in between. The title of our address this evening is what is the real plan and purpose of God regarding mankind? What is the real purpose? It's not suggesting that there perhaps could be an unreal or a fictitious purpose of God. The title is getting at the fact that it's a subject that is somewhat misunderstood. And the fact that the subject of God's purpose with this earth is misunderstood is proved by the fact that there are thousands of different religions with, throughout the earth. In fact, if you Google it, it will tell us that there are some 4,200 religions in the earth currently. And I was, I was surprised there was not more, but 4,200 religions, all stating that they believe some sort of deity or God that has a plan and a purpose. So it's safe to say that God's plan and God's purpose is not well understood. And if that's the case, how can we be sure when we present a plan and a purpose of God that it is actually the truth? Out of 4,200 versions of truth, how can we be sure that we have the truth or that what is presented is actually the one and the truth? And I'm not sure if this is the answer, but it's an answer to that question. And the answer is that we have to do the best that we can. That we have to pursue or have a diligent pursuit and love of truth as a principle in itself on an individual level. Because if, if as individuals we do not love and pursue truth, we will never find it. When approaching Bible study, we have to pursue that study with an open mind. We have to open God's word and read it 
with an aim of letting it educate us, educate us without bringing preconceived ideas of what we think the Bible should be teaching us. And if we do that, we will probably start off in the wrong direction. But we keep doing that and we keep doing that and what we find is that if we approach it with the flexibility that is driven by the need, the absolute and essential need for the entire Bible to agree with itself, we will actually find that we come out at the end of that process very close to truth. And so we will head down that path and we will find that eventually our understanding of the Bible does not agree with a certain section. And so our view will get adjusted slightly. And then further down time, as we continue our study, we'll find another section of scripture that doesn't agree with our, our current understanding and we'll get another slight adjustment. And as the years roll by and our study becomes more industrious, we'll find that those shifts in focus become smaller and smaller. And in the end, we will say, well, my understanding of the Bible allows for this, this one need that the Bible is itself, in itself, consistent. And that my view and understanding and interpretation of the Word of God is consistent from the beginning of the Bible to the end. And when we can do that, we can be satisfied as best we are able to have the truth. And that's, that's not a principle that's, that is restricted to the Bible. It's a, it's a principle we have in everyday life. It's a principle I have in, we have in the workplace, in, in engineering. If we were to come up with a product, with a, a piece of hardware or software, and we're going to release that out into the wild, we don't release that product assuming that it is truth, that it is fit for purpose. We give that product to a, a team of people whose sole purpose is to break that product. Their sole purpose within the specifications of operation is to break it. So if that product is to operate at minus 25 degrees, you put it in a freezer and make sure that it doesn't break. You heat it up to 75 degrees and make sure that the internals don't melt. You put it on a shake table to make sure it's intact when it's finished. You spray it with water to make sure the ingress protection is up, is up to scratch. And only when they have finished testing will you release that into the wild as a, a release candidate. And the principle is that that product is only as good as your effort to break it. And it's the same with biblical teaching. And this evening, God willing, as we go through some of the passages that are relevant to the subject of God's purpose, it's an individual responsibility that we take those principles and we try and break them within the framework of God's word to make sure that everything stated is consistent with every other passage of the Bible. And only when we cannot break our understanding or interpretation of God's word can we, can we stand back and say that I believe the truth. So let's then have a look at the plan and the purpose of God with this earth. The starting point has to be that God is the creator of all things. It's a given, if we are a Bible student, that God is the creator. It's stated so in, in Genesis 1 verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not open for dispute. He created it. God was the beginning of what he had intended. In John chapter 1 and verse 3, all things came into being through him and apart from him nothing that exists came into being. It's not really open for discussion. God is the creator of heaven and earth and all that is in it. At the end of the Bible, from the very beginning to the very end, the message is consistent. God is the creator. It is fitting, O our Lord and God, that we should ascribe unto thee the glory and the honour and the power for thou didst create all things, and because it was thy will, they came into existence and were created. So God is the creator, and I've highlighted the words thy will because it, it's, it's speaking of a purpose behind an act. He didn't create it just spontaneously. He created it because, he was, because it was his will and because it, it speaks to his purpose. He created the heavens and the earth with a purpose without getting specific into the why he created or what is his purpose, but just to give us a feel that there was purpose behind creation. Isaiah 48 says that God's hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. And so we can see that creation is, is shrouded in these terms of what God did with his hands and his left and his right hand. And that's picked up again in Isaiah 40. 
who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out the heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. And you can pick out those words in green and see that there is, there is purpose and metrics and there is a real aim behind what God did in his creative works. They're not, they're, not general, they're not general terms that have no meaning. They are measurable terms with real purpose and meaning behind creation. So let's talk specifically then about the purpose of God. Why did he create the heavens and the earth? Why did God put man on earth way back in Genesis chapter 1? It's, it's, it's a three-pronged answer which I want you to keep in mind for the next three slides. What is God's purpose? Well, the first point that we need to remember is that he, God created this earth to be inhabited with people. Point number one. We pick that up in Isaiah 45 and verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So the first point we want to keep in mind is that God created this earth to be inhabited with people, not to sit void and with, with nothing on it, not to fill it with animals, he created it to fill it with people. He created it to be inhabited. Point number two is that God wants to fill this earth with his glory. And that principle is spread right throughout the Bible. But to take a few quotes, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 21. Truly I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. It's picked up again in Psalm 72 and verse 19. Blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The time is coming, says Habakkuk 2 and verse 14, when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover his sea. So point number one was that this earth was intended or established to be filled with a group of people. It was created to be inhabited. Secondly, God wants to fill this earth with his glory. Whatever is on this earth, he wants it to glorify him. That's the intention behind this group of people. He's going to fill it with his glory. This group of people is going to glorify God. And so we can ask the question, what is the glory of God? And we wouldn't be the first people to ask that question because Moses, many thousands of years ago, in Exodus 33, he asked the question of God. Moses said, I beseech thee, God, show me thy glory. He wanted to know what the glory of God was. And he asked God, show me what your glory is. And God responded in the following chapter. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And I want you to remember that the name of God is associated with his glory. He asked, Moses asked, God to show him his glory and God proclaimed his name and then he went on to proclaim his character and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God merciful and gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth and you can see the principle that God's setting out for us Moses asked God what is your glory and God said Moses, I will declare my name to you and my character. That is my glory. And so God's glory are his characteristics. It's, his, it's the way he acts. It's the way he thinks. It's his morality. That's God's glory, his characteristics. And so that's the three points that we want to put together. That God wants this earth to be inhabited with a group of people. He wants to fill this earth with his glory using those people and God's glory is his character and we can make a statement out of those three points and say that this earth is to be inhabited by a population of people who have God's characteristics and in that manner we can say that this earth is filled with God's glory we have if you like and with respect miniature gods on this earth people who glorify God the way they think and the way they act and their physical being they are little models or representatives of God. 
And if that's the case, God said, I'm going to place my name on these people who glorify me, who have my character, who show to the world what I am about. I'm going to place my name on them. Isaiah 43 in verse 6 picks that up. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. And you can see how the two phrases are put together. I've created that person, I've bestowed my name on them, I've created them for my glory, because they now show the world what my glory is. That's his plan and his purpose with this earth, to fill it with his glory. He's going to fill it with a people who have his characteristics. On the subject of filling this earth with God's glory, I want to share with you the words of a Bible student from the 1800s by the name of John Thomas. And this is a, not a, a standalone passage, it's an extract from a book that he wrote. But I think it's a very important statement because it, it shows us the focus. When we come to understand the Bible a bit more deeply, we come to see the focus that we should have concerning the plan and the purpose of God. And it's a focus that's not shared by other religions who claim to believe in the Bible. Let's read through the statement and then we'll go through. It's in, it's in Old English and a bit hard to understand. So we'll read the statement and then go through some sentences. The statement says that men were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. God manifestation, not human salvation, was the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. The salvation of a multitude is incidental to the manifestation, but it was not the end proposed. So we'll leave it there for the moment and have a look at some of these statements. Men were not ushered into being for the purpose of being saved or lost. You know, the popular attitude ever since creation was that man was created so that God could save man. That's the basis of 99% of religions. That man was created for the express purpose that God might save man. And if that's not why man was created, then certainly religion was created so that God might save man. And that's a man-focused religion. And we can see that this statement actually shifts that focus from man and shifts the focus away from man and onto God. And considering the majesty of the God who, with whom, or the God that we've come to worship and, and talk about this evening, that's a good thing, isn't it? That we can shift the focus from man and onto God. And that's what this statement does because it's telling us that man was not actually created for the purpose of being saved. And that the purpose for creation has less to do with the salvation of man and more to do with the glorification of God. And that's what the second statement goes on to say. Well, we'll read the first statement. The man was not ushered into the being for the purpose of being saved or lost. So if, if the salvation of man was not the purpose, what was the purpose of God in his creation of man? Well, the second statement says this. God manifestation, not human salvation, was the grand purpose of the eternal spirit. So human salvation was not the primary focus of creation. And he's telling us that actually something called God manifestation was what God, what was God's primary intention in his creative work. Now God manifestation is not something that we hear a lot about. In fact, it's, it's a difficult concept or it's a, an unfamiliar concept. So let's have a look at what this word God manifestation actually means. The word manifestation comes from a Latin verb, manifestare, meaning to make public. And it's still used today. If there, we, we, we would say that there is someone has a virus and it's manifest in a rash because the embodiment of that virus is made public. You can see it, it's visible to the public in a, in a rash. So to, to manifest something is to take something that is not seen and embody it in something that is seen. It becomes a representative or an embodiment of, or a personification of a thing. And if we were to look at Oxford's dictionary, it says this about the word manifestation. An event, 
action or object that clearly shows or embodies something abstract or theoretical. Now we wouldn't say that God is either abstract or theoretical. We would say that we can't see God and that if a person was to manifest God then they would embody in a person everything that God stands for. That they are a personification of his values and his aims and his characteristics. That they think like God, that they act like God and that they are gloriously immortal like God. That is a manifestation of God on this earth. And we have an example of that in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He had the character of his Father. We would say that he was the Word of God on earth because he was the perfect manifestation of God. John chapter 17. The Lord, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have glorified thee on the earth. What does that mean? He has shown to the world the glory or the, the characteristics of God that glorify him. He's shown to the world what, what God's characteristics, what God's characteristics are. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Now this is a different translation of the same passage. This is Weymouth's translation. I have glorified thee on the earth, having done perfectly the works by which, work which by thine appointment has been mine to do. I have revealed thy perfections. And we can see how the two translations line up the name of God and the perfections of his character. It's just reinforcing what we saw back from Exodus. So we can see that the Lord Jesus Christ, in glorifying God on earth, was a manifestation to the world. He was the very embodiment of the characteristic of God. And so God placed his name on his son. And so this statement goes on. The salvation of a multitude is incidental to the manifestation, but it was not the end proposed. If we were to think about someone that actually that does manifest God, that God's purpose is complete. This earth would be filled with people who think like God, who act like God, and are immortal like God. They have God's physical glory. That means they can't die. God current is, is immortal, and so is this person. Neither can die. They do not corrupt, they live forever. They cannot sin. If we were to describe that in a word, we would say that person has been saved. They've been saved from death. And so this statement is saying, well, the salvation of that person is incidental to the manifestation, but it was not the end proposed. The fact that that person is now in that state is nice, but it's a byproduct of the fact that they are glorifying God forevermore. And so you can see the subtle or not so subtle shift in focus in God's aim. His aim is not to save people. His aim is to glorify himself. But in the process, and thankfully, men and women will be saved through that process of God manifesting his own glory in this earth. And so the rest of that statement goes on to say that the eternal spirit or God intended to enthrone himself on the earth and in so doing to develop a divine family, that's this group of people, from among men, every one of whom shall be spirit because they are born of spirit, they are immortal, and that this family shall be large enough to fill the earth when perfected to the entire exclusion of those that are mortal, flesh and blood. And so the plan and purpose of God involves us it involves us developing his characteristics that we might show them off to the world. That we might show to the world the God who we believe in. This is what he does. This is what he thinks and this is what is important to him. How are we going to do that? It only becomes possible by us coming to know God. To know what his character is. What is important to him. What his, what, the way he thinks. The way he would act. We have to come to a knowledge of God in order for this plan and this, and this purpose to, uh, to work. 
in our own life, if we were to say, how do we be saved? How do we get life eternal? Well, we have to come to know God, don't we? And that's what the Lord says in John 17 and verse 3. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And in the context of what we've been looking at, that's a logical statement, isn't it? That if we want to get life eternal through manifesting God, then we have to know what to manifest. We have to come to know him and not know him like we would wave to the postman, but to know him in depth. We have to know him personally. And if we were to study the word deeply, and we, and we do this quite a lot, we go into the original language, which the New Testament happens to be Greek, to try and get a better understanding of what was intended behind those words. And the word know in this verse, in the Greek, is the Greek word gnosko. And uh, Bullinger wrote a, a dictionary, and he says that word means this, to perceive, observe, obtain a knowledge of or insight into. It denotes a personal and true relation between the person knowing and the object known. And this is quite an, an important point. To be influenced by one's knowledge of the object, to suffer oneself to be determined thereby. And that's important in the context that we're reading it in, isn't it? Because we have to come to a knowledge of God's character to such an extent that we allow ourselves and our character to be determined thereby. To know God to such an extent that it actually determines our course in life. That we can decide to be like God and, and to manifest his characteristics to the world. And so it's not, it's not surprising then as we go through the scripture that God tells us of certain characteristics that he's interested in. That he wants to see in us because he wants them on the earth in the future age. Matthew 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, or people that are humble, for theirs is the kingdom of God. They're going to be there at that time when all these people are manifesting God. Blessed are the meek, people that are not headstrong but willing to conform to God's character, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? And so there's some of the characteristics that God says will be rewarded in being participants in the age to come. It's a probably a well-known principle that, that suffering develops character but it's interesting to view that in terms of God's plan and his purpose because God is trying to develop in us characteristics that are important to him and it happens to be that characteristics that are important to God are things that we develop through hardship and so that even the world is acquainted with the fact that trial and tribulation develop our character that's a biblical principle and because those characteristics are going to be rewarded with showing off to the world God's or filling this earth with God's glory in the age to come, an entrance into God's kingdom is going to depend on our suffering and our trials and our tribulations today because that is how we develop the characteristics that God is going to allow into his kingdom. And so we get statements like this. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Why would you glory in tribulation? Because it's with the understanding that that will actually develop a godlike character and that will be useful in God's plan and purpose with this earth. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and knowing that patience is a godly characteristic. He's a long-suffering God. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why is that? Because a light affliction now will develop a godlike character. And that will lead to glory in the age to come. Not our glory. And if it is, it is but a reflection of the glory of God. And so we get statements like Acts chapter 14 and verse 2. 
that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Or if you like, you can't enter into the kingdom of God unless you go through tribulation and develop a godlike character. Romans 8 and verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified, that we may be also glorified together. And so the Bible talks about these characteristics and trials and tribulations and the building of a character through a life. And so God talks about a life leading up to a reward. He says you have to, in these days of probation, strive to do what is right, live through trials and tribulations, and try and live by my commandments in an effort that we might develop a Christ-like or a God-like character. And so it's a way of life that will ultimately fulfill God's plan and purpose. Romans 6 says in verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become the servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's a way of life, isn't it? It's not something we're born with, the character of God, but it's a way of life and it requires us to become servants of God, to keep his commandments, to do his will, to develop that character which is pleasing unto him. And the end of that is everlasting life. Not that that's the purpose in mind, but it's a byproduct of God filling this earth with his glory. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So developing this character, it, it is a very determined way of life, of trying, of trying to fight that fight of faith, of keeping the commandments, of failing because of the nature which we bear, but still striving our best to keep the commandments of God. And we've, we've talked about that God's character is the basis of what is right and what is wrong. And he's asked us to put into practice his principles in our life now that it might be used in the age to come. And that's totally at odds with this world's definition of morality because they view morality as something that, uh, that, is, that is fluid and that it changes with the aims and whims of society. And that morality becomes what is actually sociably acceptable in the day and age in which you live. That's not the teaching of the Bible. The Bible teaches us that morality is defined by the character of God. That's what is right. And the Bible also tells us that God doesn't change. Malachi 3 and verse 6, I am the Lord, I change not. It's as simple as that. In James 1 and verse 17, in God there is no variation or the slightest suggestion of change. And if that's the case, it's an interesting point that morality therefore cannot change. The principles on what, or the principles, the foundation of morality on what God calls right and what God calls wrong has not changed since creation. Yes, some of his laws have changed. The law of Moses was for a particular period of time, but his principles, his character, has not changed, and nor does morality. So that's just a side issue. So we've been talking about the fact that God wants us to develop a God-like characteristic, that we have to strive to do what is right, to follow the commandments of Christ, develop a God-like character, act in a way that God would act. And what he's asked us to do is a very high calling. If we were to do that in the literal sense, we would be sinless. Because the definition of sin is to miss that mark of the glory of God. And that's impossible for any man that is born of two human parents. We can't do that all the time. And so God has opened up the way for us to strive to be as best as we can. But where we fail, he will forgive our sins. And that's the subject of baptism, which we don't have time to delve into this evening. But it tells us in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be condemned and i want to bring that up because it's important when we're talking about the plan and the purpose of god that if we wish to be involved in that plan and purpose that baptism is actually an essential first step in our walk to developing a godlike character 
Acts 22 and verse 16, links the two concepts together, being baptised and the washing away of sins in baptism. And it's an outward display, is baptism, of us stopping in the middle of life where we have come to a knowledge of God's plan and purpose. It's putting to death the way of life that we used to have and it's embarking on a new way of life. It's in, a, in the pursuit of developing a godly character. That's what baptism is all about. And it opens up the way for us where we fail to do that in its fullest sense to receive the forgiveness of our sins. And so the day is coming when God's glory or God's purpose will come to fruition. When God's glory will fill this earth from sea to sea. And it will be populated with a people who have the character of God. And we term that period of time the kingdom of God. If we just come to Psalm 72, we're going to close our remarks with some of the characteristics of that kingdom. The characteristics of that kingdom is going to be a glorious time because it's going to be based on right things, on the character of God, the very definition of righteousness. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to be king over a group of people who have the very definition of righteousness as their character. And so what kind of a world will that be? It's going to be a very glorious and refreshing time and something that every one of us can actually look forward to and place, in our, place hope in as, as, as something to be aspired to. And we read some of the characteristics of this kingdom in the future age in Psalm 72, our reading this evening. On that occasion in verse 1, it says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. The whole kingdom age is going to be based on the characteristics of God, which is righteousness. And the righteous rule of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to flow throughout all the earth. It's going to administer righteous principles and righteous laws throughout the entire earth and it's going to end in a world at peace. Verse 2, he will judge thy poor with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. Verse 4, he shall judge the poor with, of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and break in pieces the oppressor. And so the righteousness of God is going to be meted out to all people. It's going to be a glorious time, ladies and gentlemen. In verse 6, it tells us how that's going to be received. It tells us that this time that is entirely based on the righteousness of God and his glory being throughout the earth is going to be so refreshing. It is described in verse 6 as, He shall come down like rain upon mown grass as showers that water the earth. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that has whet your appetite concerning what the Bible teaches concerning the plan and the purpose of God. I hope you can see that God actually did have a plan in mind when he created this earth, that he created it to glorify himself. But along the way, he's invited us that we can be part of that plan and that purpose, that we can spend time in the kingdom of God, embodying and displaying to the world his character, and his glory. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, you can find it within you to look into these things and decide whether or not it is the truth, to make sure that that message is actually consistent from the very beginning of the Bible to the very end. And then you can hold it to yourself that we do actually have the truth.